So the point of this video is to give you a recipe for constructing the weight diagrams of irreducible representations of SU3. So here's the theorem. For every pair of non-negative integers k and l, there is an irreducible representation of SU3, which I'm going to call gamma kl, whose weight diagram is given by a recipe that I'm going to tell you right now. And uh, gamma KL is unique up to isomorphism in the sense that if another irreducible representation has the same weight diagram, then it's isomorphic to gamma KL. And moreover, this is a complete list, so every irreducible representation of SU3 has its weight diagram constructed in this way. So what are K and L? What role do they play? Well, they're the kind of input. So I'm going to start by specifying a point in this diagram that's going to be one of our weights. It's actually going to be our highest weight. And it's going to be the point K lots of L1 minus L lots of L3. So I'm going to illustrate this with um, the point K equals 1, L equals 2. So you go 1 along the L1 direction and then minus 2 up the L3 direction. Remember L3 points down here. Okay, so we're going to get a point, if, if k and l are non-negative, we're going to get a point in this quadrant. Well, it's not really a quadrant, is it a uh, sextant of the, uh, of the plane? Um, and you can get any point uh, up there using some values of k and l. Uh, okay, what are we going to do with this point? Let me give the point a name, let me call it lambda. So lambda is kl1 minus ll3. We're going to take lambda and we're going to translate it in all possible ways using the action of the vial group. In other words, we're going to reflect it in these three lines in all possible ways. So let's reflect it first across this line to get here, and then down across this line to get here, straight down across the horizontal line to get here, across this line to get here, across this line to get here. And now if we were to reflect one more time, we get back up to lambda. And that makes sense because the vial group is generated by these three reflections. It has size 6 because if you reflect twice in two different lines, you get a rotation. So you actually get three reflections and three rotations in the vial group. So the, the vial group in this case has size 6. It's the symmetry group of an equilateral triangle. Um, so we'd never get more than six points by starting somewhere and reflecting. It would be possible to get three points if we'd started maybe here on on one of the lines of reflection because then one of the reflections would stabilize that point we'd only end up with half as many points um, but i've picked this uh, this hexagonal case because it's a bit more interesting to, to illustrate what's going on but there's nothing wrong in principle with starting on one of the lines of reflection okay so we do that and we get six points now our weight diagram is going to be contained in the polygon you get by connecting these guys with straight lines. So let's do that. Okay, so there's a fancy name for what I just did. I took these six points and connected them with lines. The fancy name is taking the convex hull of those points. It's the smallest polygon that contains all six points. So here's the first two steps. Let me write them down. First step, um, reflect lambda uh, using the vial group of reflections and rotations um, to get either three or six points. And then take the convex hull of those points to get a polygon. I'm going to call that polygon P. So in this case P is a hexagon. It's not a regular hexagon. Some lines uh, are longer than other lines, but it is a hexagon. So our weight diagram is going to be contained in that polygon P and it's going to consist of some of these integer points in the lattice, um, these dots in the diagram. But it's not going to be all of the points. It's not going to be all of these black dots in the diagram because 
think back to SU2. You know, for SU2, um, the the analog of this polygon was an interval in the in the line, and we we had weights like two, zero, minus two for the adjoint representation, for example. So we didn't get all of the integer points in between two and minus two. We just got the even ones in that case. So we're going to have something similar going on here. So which of the lattice points am I going to take? Um, so here's here's what I do. So take as weights the points in P, possibly on the boundary of P as well, of the form uh, lambda plus R with R in the root lattice. So what's the root lattice? Right, the lattice we've been looking at, the weight lattice, uh, is generated by L1, L2, and L3, L1 and L2. The root lattice is a sub lattice, and it's this one. So if this is the origin, what were our roots? They were the, the weights of the adjoint representation. So they were things like L1 minus L2, or L1 minus L3. They were these vertices of this hexagon I'm drawing now. And the root lattice is just the thing you get by taking all integer linear combinations of those six points. So things like this guy, this guy, uh, this guy, this guy, right? So to get to this point, I've just marked with an X, you go along L1 minus L3, and then along L1 minus L2. So you take some linear combination of roots to get to there. And so you end up with a lattice that looks like this. Um, okay, so when I say you, you take points of the form lambda plus r with r in the root lattice, what that really means is you take the origin of the root lattice to be sitting at lambda, and then you, so you translate it to that point. That gives you a lattice, and then you just take the, the blue dots that sit inside P. So let's see what that looks like in this example. Here's our lambda. We go along the roots in all possible ways, but we stay inside P, the hexagon. And these are the points we get. So we don't get all of the dots. We don't get all the black dots. We just get those blue dots. Okay, so those will be the weights in our diagram uh, for gamma KL. Uh, and we're almost done. We just need to think about what those dots really mean, right? So each dot is a weight space. It's a subspace of the representation. So drawing a dot might not quite be enough to specify that subspace. Because not all of those subspaces need to be one dimensional. They might be higher than one dimensional. So for example, for SU2, in the irreducible representations, every single weight space was one dimensional. We just had to draw a dot to say which weight it was. But when you started combining them, you know, taking direct sums, then the weight spaces might have been higher dimensional. And actually for SU3, even for the irreducible representations, it's possible for the weight spaces to be higher dimensional than just one. So I'm going to give you a recipe for saying what the dimensions of the weight spaces are for this uh, gamma KL. I'm not going to justify it in this video. We can maybe talk about it in class. If you're interested in this more generally, it's it's quite a difficult problem to try and figure out what these uh, the, the dimensions of the weight spaces are. Uh, but there are formulae that tell you the answer. So things like the Weyl character formula or the Freudenthal multiplicity formula encode this information in a way from which you can extract the answer. Um. Incidentally, the dimension of a weight space is also referred to as its multiplicity. So here's the algorithm for determining the multiplicities in the weight diagrams for an irreducible representation of SU3. You take the outermost shell of weights, this sort of uh, hexagon of weights on the outside, and you give them all multiplicity 1. 
So that's for any of these irreducible representations, gamma, KL. And then you strip off that outer shell of weights and what's left is a smaller shell of weights. And you're going to assign those all the same number as well, the same multiplicity. And the number that you assign them is one more than the outer shell, if the outer shell was a hexagon, which in this case it is. So in this case we're going to put two on each of these three vertices. If the outer shell had been a triangle rather than a hexagon, then we would have used the same multiplicity on the next shell in. Right, so you strip off a shell, next shell, the multiplicity you use is either one more if the outer shell was a hexagon, or the same if the outer shell was a triangle. So rather than try and write that down in any precise way, let's just do some examples and see how it works in practice. Okay, so the first example I'm gonna do is gamma to zero. So I go two along the L1 axis, um, I get to this point, I reflect it using the vial group. Well, reflection in this line takes us here, reflection in the horizontal line takes us here. Any other reflection will take us to one of these three points because these points will lie on a line of reflection, so they're fixed by one of the reflections. So we really just get a triangle of three weights in this case. I connect them with straight lines, form the convex hull, just like before to get my polygon P and then I fill in the uh, the weights inside that that I want to count so this lambda is going to be one of them uh, this is uh, lambda minus L1 plus L3 so that's connected to lambda by a root this one is also uh, so I'll just fill them all in you get these six points here and multiplicities, well, they're all on the outer shell, so they all get ones. That's it. The multiplicity is one in each case. There's no stripping off of anything. Okay, so this is the weight diagram, gamma two zero. This is actually the same as one we've already seen, which is sim two of the standard representation. So it's good that we've got one of our weight diagrams already. Uh, it's showing up already. The same thing. It's uniquely specified by this diagram. Okay, another example. Okay, so for this example, I'm going to do gamma 6, 1. So I go 6 along, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then 1 in the minus L3 direction, I end up here. That's my highest weight. I reflect that using the vial group. So I get this point, I get this point this point, this point, this point, I think that's it, six points, so this is a hexagon again, connected up to this convex hole, and now I need to pick the weights inside this convex hole, they're going to differ from my lambda, this one, um, by a root, so I get points like this, 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 right? So I'm just taking linear combinations of roots and moving along them, uh, for, starting from lambda. So I'm just gonna draw those now. Okay, I think I got all of them. Um, so those are my lattice points that are gonna be my weights. So now I need to assign multiplicities, right? So all these outer weights are gonna have multiplicity one like that. And when I strip off that outer hexagon of uh, weight spaces, what's left is this triangle here. So I've stripped off a hexagon, so the next shell should all get weight two, right? one more than what I had on the outside. As I stripped off a hexagon. So these are all gonna be twos, like that. And now I've got to strip off this second triangle and see what's left. Well, there's this slight, oops, straight. There's a slightly smaller triangle inside. Because I'm stripping off a triangle, I end up using the same multiplicity for this inner triangle. So these are also going to be twos. If 
I was stripping off a hex again, it would have gone up to three, but I'm not. I'm stripping off a triangle, so it goes stays at two. And that's it. I've I've dealt with all the weights, so the multiplicities on the outside are one, and all the others are two. Okay, so that's how it works in practice. Let's do one more example. So for this final example, I'm going to take the point three three. This would be gamma. 3, 3. If I reflect using the vial group, I get these six points. Uh, this point. I take the convex hull, get this hexagon. Now, uh, which are the weights that occur? in the weight diagram. Well, I have this lambda. Let me just draw them. Okay, I think I got them all. It's the ones that are separated from lambda by a root lattice element. Um, okay, what about the multiplicities? Well, again, the outer hexagon all gets multiplicity. When we strip that off, we're left with a second hexagonal shell here. And because we've stripped off a hexagon, that shell, all the weights will get multiplicity two, one more than the outer shell. And when we strip that off, what's left is this oops, smaller hexagon inside. And because we've stripped off a hexagon, these are all going to have multiplicity three. And finally, we strip off that hexagon. And what's left is the origin. And because we stripped off a, a hexagon, the origin gets multiplicity 4. Okay, so I did this one just to show what happens when you get all the way down into the origin. Okay, so this is how you assign multiplicities to weight diagrams. I am not going to prove this. Um, we can discuss it in class. If you want to read more about it, you're going to have to go and learn about the vile character formula or the Freudenthal multiplicity formula. Um, but what we're going to do next instead is use this description of the irreducible representations and their weight diagrams to decompose some tensor products of representations of SU3. We'll see some applications to things like uh, quark physics. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll prove the rest of this theorem. So everything except the statement about multiplicities will show that this is how you get the weight diagrams. Okay.